Well, here we are again, Tim. This week went by so fast since we last spoke together. <laughs> and they're going by faster. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. Um, I'm 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 starting to run out of time in my days. I don't know how I'm going to be able to keep up the schedule, but you know what? It's worth trying. <laughs> you know, in, in the words of a friend of mine, dude, you're a project manager. That's what you do. <laughs> you run out of time because you got so much. And when you finally get a hold of it and when you finally get a handle on your project, you take on more because that's who you are. You're that's a project right. manager, right? Exactly. Exactly. So you know, so what do you want to talk about this week? What what did we plan on talking about? Well, we've been kind of marching down the ideas of the from the uh, project management book of knowledge, those 12 concepts of uh, what are the 12 principles, right? Right. The, the 12. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. The 12 principles. Yeah. And so I think maybe and this is totally unplanned, but I think maybe it, considering our initial gambit this, today in terms of project managers taking on more. It seems like we love our challenges. And I think one of those principles deals with complexity. Yes, and I think that may be a great place to uh, to park this this week. That would be that would be fun. So so why don't you start us off and give us a little context and maybe <clears throat> we can uh, delve in here. Well, you know, as, as I was thinking of this complexity, the whole idea of complexity, I was thinking of past projects uh, and complexity comes at us. Either from sometimes we know about it when we start the project. Sometimes it comes at us from kind of uh, left field where we're not anticipating it. But as I was thinking through some of my past projects, I did a project for the state of Alaska, worked with my team there. One of the complexities there is just the environment, the physical geographic environment where it's low population with many remote villages and towns that we had to be able to get our system into so that people could respond, you know, back to uh, where the main computer was in the city of Juneau. I was thinking of, uh, I did a project in the state of Hawaii, and there were, again, geographical complexities with different islands being served by the system we were putting in. I was thinking of, uh, for example, a project we did in the, in the Midwest state where one of the main interfaces between our system was with a, with a sister organization system, and the two had competing requirements such that there was a great deal of complexity having those two systems talk to each other when they needed to do. And I was thinking many, many, many of these situations where complexity comes at us from so many different ways that we have to kind of anticipate this and be prepared to deal with them as project managers. Let's, How's that let's, for a kind of a setting of context? That's that's really great. That's really great. But but I I think we have uh, an intuitive understanding of complexity. But how would you describe complexity to somebody who'd never heard the word before? That's a good question because, as you said, we have an intuitive understanding. Um, I think from uh, from the an IT perspective, complexity, you know, it's, it can result from it's basically it's challenging situations that can result from our human relationships on a project. Uh, as I mentioned, environmental, such as the geographical situations, I can talk about uncertainty. Uncertainty allows for a lot of complexity. I think it's anything that challenges our kind of straightforward notion of moving the project along. That's the best way I can describe it. I know you've got more of a, of a uh, probably educated or educational <laughs> description <laughs> of complexity. So, so let's think about it this way. Yeah, I like the way you're thinking. I like how you described it. Let's add another layer of detail. Okay. Um, so, if you think of business and projects as a bunch of interconnected systems. And they are, yeah. Complexity is like the number of systems and how interconnected they are. So when you get something that's really complex, you can't take the pieces and from the pieces figure out what the big picture looks like. 
And you can't take the big picture and figure out what the pieces look like. And that's what we call complex. It's not easy to either decompose or to, uh, or to um, innovate from in a complex system because it's not, you can't just look at it and say, oh, I understand what's going on here. And, ju and just so I understand what you were saying, you don't mean systems as in everything being a computer system, do you? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm talking about business systems. I'm talking about people systems. I, I'm talking about systems as a group of function and processes, whether it's inside a computer, inside a group of people, inside an organization, doesn't matter. Yeah. So it's so you're what you're talking about is a lot of different factors that all combine, all combined can come into one huge, large, complex problem for us to solve. Right, right. And yeah. and again, it's the nature of the complexity itself that makes it difficult. Well, I'm I'm reminded as we talk about this, there was a politician in the United States years ago that talked about, was it the unknown unknowns? Yes. And yes. If you, and if you really think about it, what we're talking about in many ways, <clears throat> excuse me, um, complexity can come at us in terms of known unknowns. Oh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna really confuse our audience now. <laughs> unknown knowns, so known unknowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns. I mean, all of those kind of can add to what it is that we as project managers and as people working on a project have to deal with. So, so let let me let's walk through that. So you okay. have you have basically two words, and both can either be known or unknown. Okay. Yeah. And so we basically have a, a two by two matrix, right? Yeah. The first word, known or unknown, is we've identified it or not. Correct. Yeah. The second is we understand them and, and we can predict how they're going to behave. Or not. Or not. Or not. Yeah. <laughs> so when you have a known known, you've identified it, you can predict how it's going to behave. So you have a fact, right? Yeah, and, and probably not a complexity. Right, right. You have a known unknown, you've identified it, but you don't know how it's going to behave. Yeah. So it, it has to be an assumption or we can't validate it for some reason, we can't really come up with it. And in those cases, I would probably step forward and see how it, it reveals itself. Right, right. And then we've had unknown knowns, which are assumptions that need to be dealt with proactively. These are the ones that we know about them. We know what might happen, but we don't know if or whether they will happen. So that's See, almost, if I understand that one correctly, that almost fits in the cal, um, what we would call risk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They they look at risks and responses. And yeah. that's that's a good one to think about it. And then we have our unknown unknowns, which are true surprises like COVID. <laughs> yeah. Basically, yeah. basically they're unidentified risks. Absolutely. So, so, Again, you know, we're just looking at two factors here, um, the ability to predict something or plan something or understand it and the ability to identify it. And we've already started looking at complexity itself. That's yeah. that's a good that that's a good way of introducing complexity, by the way. I, yeah, I think so. And I just it kind of came to me as we were talking about in terms of just how. I would look at it and it's those things that you're dealing with on a project. I I much prefer the known knowns, by the way. Yo, yeah, oh, me too. Me too. That's that's why I like traditional projects, but uh <laughs> you know, the other thing I was thinking of, there's many, many we talked about environmental factors, we talked about uh, human factors, we talked about all the kinds of things that can introduce complexity into the system. And again, I want to reiterate what I said up front. Complexity isn't just what happens at the beginning of developing the system. In other words, we're developing the system to take care of some complexity perhaps in the business environment, but complexity can spring out at us at any time during the, the progress of the system. 
And I think in my entire experience, the one thing that I have never uh, been able to deal with handily is the complexity that is introduced because of the aggressiveness of our timelines. There is an assumption from executives and leaders, and I put myself in the same category of executives and leaders, that when I put a stick in the sand, it's going to really occur no matter what. Yeah. And um, the problem is no matter what, all of a sudden becomes a reflection of how good a leader or how good a worker or how good an organization I'm part of. And, and that's when we get in trouble, when, when we can't actually back away from these numbers that we've stated in public. Well, and not only that is, um, if I recall, even when I was kind of on the front lines of many projects, when I was given those aggressive timelines, myself as a member of the team, we would all push together and we would work all nighters if we had to, to not disappoint our leadership. So in many ways, we as worker bees contributed to that <laughs> aggressiveness, probably rightly so, but at the same time, you know, you think about it, we wore out a lot of people. Yeah. And, and again, this is, this is just part of how humans are it, you know, you can go back to hunter gatherer society, right? If I can actually get a lot of food built up, I can sit around the fire and tell stories for an extra week or so, right? And and it's a survival mechanism for, you know, if I can if I can actually create value earlier. It's it's funny to think it that way, but we create our own complexity just by the nature of of the way we are as humans. If I can just add that extra button that does this extra function, everybody will be happy and boy, we'll have made something really neat. And I might get my next promotion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so we talked about aggressiveness of timeline, but think of think of other factors. Uh, you know, I was kind of generic in my description, but what other factors that come to your mind um, for our audience that um, are, when they're introduced to the project, also introduce complexity? Oh, anything that's added to a project can increase it you know again we can talk about scope creep you know unapproved change changes that actually add things with unintended uh consequences um like uh you know let like i said add an extra button at the bottom well it'll do that but what else will it do you know and if it's an unapproved change we can't predict that we, we have to put that change through its paces to understand how it's going to behave. And then we can also look at things like things that change the way we communicate, right? All of a sudden, you know, where the uh, corporate IT has said, we're not going to go with WebEx, we're going to go with Zoom. And you have two weeks of relearning, um, stakeholders changing, risk changing, and uh just straight old technological innovation, you know, coming up with new ideas. Innovations are great on a project, but if they're just uh, applied without, you know, considered analytical um, um, practice, you, you can get in trouble. Well, I, I just remember even the, my very first internet-based project when we went from kind of a procedural coding you know, where you laid uh, laid out your project and people did um, did their computing. Our end users did their computing in a transactional basis. And suddenly we had this new internet-based computing where you had to kind of anticipate which button the and deliver results based on which button the end user pressed at which time. And suddenly the complexity, you know, you thought it was easier. It is for the end user, but we introduced complexity because none of our programmers were used to that kind of coding and that kind of uh, implementation of systems. So just that flip in technology uh, introduced incredible complexity to many of our projects. Until oh, got... yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it's funny because we, we read experts doing this stuff and just making these minor changes, going to an object-oriented model. 
yeah. for, for code development. And you go, wow, that's cool. It makes things easy. <laughs> and we forget that, you know, the adoption of even just, you know, uh, uh, development models are um, actually, you know, confuse people. I, I saw this also when uh, I, I was working with a lot of clients in the early 2000s and they were trying to adopt Agile. And, and they saw the benefits of Agile, but they didn't see the cost that came with those benefits. And so there were so many projects that were crashed and burned. And a lot of companies just said, we're not going to deal with Agile right now. We're not going to look at it for four or five years. Let's clean up the mess we made and see what we're going to go next. Well, I think part of that, too, was people are now or organizations are now realizing that Agile has to start with the top down. So it's not just you. You dump Agile on your project development teams and go away. It has to go right all the way from the CIO and the pro and the management and the leadership to understand exactly what it is that we're getting with Agile. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, one, one of the other ones that uh, I was reminded of is we were in the middle of a fairly uh, large project and it was complex in its own way. But then we had a massive legislative change in the middle of that project. Yeah. <laughs> That meant that the rules that we were implementing changed. And, you know, the first thing you do as a project <clears throat> team is you try to salvage work that's already gone past because you don't want to waste all of that. Effort. You don't want to just throw out a million lines of code because you've got new legislation. You want to salvage. And so you we added a lot of complexity there, just understanding the new rules, understanding the new requirements understanding what we could salvage and what that meant to our technology. So again, things come at us from left field to quote a U.S. favorite expression, and we have to be able to pre be prepared to deal with those. So, so, so what are these sources of complexity? We've said, you know, we have executives who are adding complexity. We have the workers, the team members who are bringing complexity. We have emerging technology that's bringing complexity. What what other areas of the project in, influences can actually create complexity? Well, for me, I mentioned the aggressiveness of timelines before, which, you know, expectations of getting things done quicker. But I think another one was um, either undefined or ambiguous requirements. I think that is one of the largest probably most um, feared areas of complexity for any project team. You know, um, one of the reasons why I really started enjoying talking with you earlier was your understanding in the formal engagement of stakeholders early in a project to train them, to, to help them understand not just what their roles were, in helping deliver the deliverable, but also in how you the the stakeholders and the team members were going to communicate and work together and share the same ideas. These massive systems that you worked on, um, I I think to myself on a lot of my projects, I thought, well, you know, I'll sit down over a cup of coffee with my stakeholders a couple times. They'll be fine with understanding how to work with the team. That doesn't work in your world at all. <laughs> well, no, and a lot of my stakeholders had competing priorities. So then, and sometimes you weren't always aware as to who the uh, sort of senior or uh, you know the main stakeholder was. Yeah, there was a person who signed the contract, but was that the person who truly understood the needs and the objectives of the organization through the system? So, yeah, we had we would often have to deal with that in ambiguity right up front, and it was challenging and it created complexity. Yeah, I uh, I often would have the federal government as a stakeholder, and they'd turn around and say, "This is the way you're going to do things." Yeah, and we said, "Thank you." Tell us when you uh, need to give us direction next time also. Uh, but um, I one of my favorite experiences, not looking at it in hindsight, of course, was when I was an IT director of that state agency. And we had a database. It had like 9 million records of 10% of the state's population in it. 
And the governor's office said, we have just gotten the ruling from the federal government, and here's how we're going to have to do it. You need to tell us within 30 days how you're going to make the change and exactly when you're going to communicate the that you're no longer using government ID numbers as personal keys to recognize individuals. Your application cannot track people by anything so precious as a government ID. That was that was monumental. We had to spend like about two days just wrapping our heads around how we were going to approach to estimate that effort. Well, and, and I, I was faced with something very similar. And it wasn't so much that you couldn't use the government ID. You just couldn't use it as a key. You could right. keep it in the database. You, in fact, we were required in many cases by the rules. You just couldn't disclose it. And so then I remember our very first reports going out after we made the changes. And someone forgot to scrub that ID off of the reports that went out to the and to the client. So yeah, you know, try to do everything right, and something still can slip through. Adding, of course, to complexity. <laughs> you you have to realize, and and one of the things that I did realize because of because of the nature of projects and work, and because there's so, so much human component to the work we do. We have to realize that there's going to be unintended consequences of every action, of every simplification, and any change we make on our work. It has to be that due to the nature of, of you know, the, the world we live in and the way humans behave. Well, exactly. And, and even as I was doing some reading this morning, this whole concept now of artificial intelligence you know, and I don't think that we as an IT, um, IT, as IT professionals really know where this is going. And yes, yeah, someone says, well, use this piece of AI in your system. Use it. That's fine. Technically, we can do that. But to me, the complexity is in the ramifications of what happens if we don't think it through to the nth degree. I watched the hearing this week. Um, up in Washington, D.C., talking about the implications of artificial in intelligence and what does the government need to do and what does big business need to do. And this actually became very evident. I was thinking about this. And number one, when people see something as complex as an artificial intelligence, which is not just one application, but it's a huge set of data with a bunch of applications working together. We create a black box and we say something goes in here, something goes out here. That's the way the human mind works. Now, the problem is what I call a black box, which is artificial intelligence, and what you call a black box is artificial intelligence is totally different. And then we get lawmakers in on the conversation and we get CEOs and then we get their engineers. And all of a sudden we realize just by saying black box, we're adding this incredible level of complexity. It's almost like there was that old fable called Pandora's box and you're just wondering. <laughs> And again, I don't want to be a doomsayer, but it, but going back to the initial thought is that we don't quite understand artificial intelligence well enough to know how to use it in projects. I don't think that's my opinion. That's not a fact. It's my opinion. Mm -hmm. But in, in doing so, have we just and I think it's going to be huge for us. But have we just added a level of complexity that we're not yet quite prepared to understand how to deal with. I think there was a lot of wisdom to come out of that two and a half hour discussion in Washington, D.C. Um, the, at the end, they all agreed on both sides of the commission. They, they all agreed. Yes, we need to start working on, with it and playing with it. And there are pieces of things out there in the world right now that are early. But we have to approach it with caution and understanding that we don't have all the answers yet. Yeah, and I and I guess that's part of the world of project management is even on any project we enter is we don't have all the answers yet. 
statements. So. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's that's both <laughs> both the benefit and the cost of doing the type of work we have. That's the nature of change. We we really we we have the ability, you know, to predict things to a great extent in some areas, but you know, that doesn't mean that we can actually do true you know, prognostication, we can't actually predict the future. We can only forecast it with a high degree of probability. And I think that's part of what we're going to start talking about here a little bit later. I think, I think forecasting is fine when we come up with things that are complex. But I think, and I have an opinion, is only the start of the process. Yeah. So let me switch gears a little bit. You know, earlier we talked about uh, one of the one of the known unknown conversations as having to involve risk. And it, my way of thinking in projects over the last 40 years is that the more complex, the more risk. But there's a way I, I think also of looking at it in terms of how does risk it, it actually influence complexity rather than the way we traditionally think of complexity influencing risk. Do you think risk influences complexity? In two ways, I think I think I can I can actually describe two factors. It's not it's not the whole picture, but two factors. Number one, think of an electronic circuit. Even if you're not an electrical engineer, you can think of a circuit, right? And every time you put two wires together and connect them with solder, you create a connection, right? And each connection has a chance of being made incorrectly, falling apart. So with just that picture, the more connections you have, the more complex your system is mm -hmm. and the more unpredictable it has to be. Now, there's another side of risk that we need to think about. So, so risk is made up of two pieces, right? It might happen. And if it does happen, it'll have an impact. Right. Yep. One thing I've learned that actually that actually has helped me and steered me in a right direction is that with the proper attitude and the proper tools, we can actually add risk into our work and into our estimation, not to get a more precise forecast, but to get a more accurate forecast. For instance, if I want to get a precise, I'll do a single point estimate and say that'll be done in 15.3 hours, and I'm going to be wrong. Okay, I know I'm going to be wrong. But what I can say is with the proper set of tools, we have a chance, and that's about an 85% chance, you know, 85 out of 100 times, it'll be within this range. Mm -hmm. And that may not be as precise, but it's going to be incredibly more accurate. So the way you've just described that, the, the risk that we're that we're looking at. So typically you, you there's some sort of formulation that the project does, right? To give the risk a score. But depending on the score that we assign to that risk response coupling could determine the complexity that comes out of the way we solution it. Exactly. Uh, we can't really eliminate the complexity, but we can create a boundary around the complexity such that we can minimize the confusion. Um, this is this is why in Agile we create prototypes and models and we do pilot projects so that we actually take little pieces of work and say, I can't think about the big picture. It's too complicated. But what I can look at is a small piece and start to understand that small piece. Yeah, which makes sense because then the risk is also reduced as you deal with small pieces. Maybe that's maybe that's the next topic we, we can kind of explore here is in terms of the, the whole idea of agile and complexity. Let's set a foundation here. What um, What's a good way for a project manager to explain 
agile work or agile projects to a stakeholder who's never heard it before? Well, I'll try to give you my layperson's explanation. I, I think I can, I think I can understand it from a project perspective, but if I were to explain this to someone who never heard of it before, I would say we would look at small areas of the functionality that that particular stakeholder wants implemented or automated and then implemented. And I would begin by looking at, say, we would predefine a period of time, let's say two to three weeks, where my team would work with that person's team. And we would tease out over that two to three weeks of time an iteration that we can take part of that functionality they're looking to implement and at least get that part completed so that it's a single unit that if I were to implement it, it would be useful to my end users. In other words, it's complete. It may not be complete for the whole project, but it's complete so that it can handle one piece of the functionality. That's that's kind of a labored way of doing it, but that's how I understand it from a layperson's perspective. That's a good way to do it. Now, we can extend that. If you have a problem that is so big, you cannot wrap your head around, you can actually get together as a group, both stakeholders and team, and say, okay, what's the most important thing we need to work on first? Right. And then you approach that with that mindset. Number one, it gets the people used to working together in this way. And number two, it gives them ideas and it gives them maybe a little better direction to go with the whole big picture. And so using these little tiny iterations or repeat cycles for review and for debate gives us an opportunity to, number one, get something working earlier in the project. And number two, build on that in such a way that we can actually make really good changes to the end result and get something that we couldn't have come up with if we had just a regular plan that we followed. And even if we didn't have a situation, I think you described it as a situation where we it was so big we couldn't understand can, or we couldn't fathom the end result kind of thing. But perhaps even if it's one of those where we do know the final result that we want to get to, yet it's so large, we would still do those iterative um, iterative pieces so that we can kind of implement piece by piece by piece and build so, upon. So, so it looks like agile by its nature is, is really, you know, it's almost designed to, to manage what we call complexity here. Manage and minimize perhaps. Maybe that's the same thing, right? In this case. I would say it's it's both the same way. Um, and and again, it's just like a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku puzzle. It's um, that that's what I love about agile projects. You know, you find one handhold, just one handhold. What can we do? You know, like you said, within two or three weeks or within three or five days, what can we do right now to get a result that we can pull up and show everybody and say, this is what we have now. Can we make a better decision at the end of the week than we did at the beginning? Well, and as you were explaining that, I was thinking also the development of the smartphone. I think when Apple or um, some of the other teams decided to develop a smartphone, I don't think they envisioned something that we have even today. But because they were able to put small iterative working pieces in place, early on and kind of give us and end users that kind of off factor. Wow, I can do this with a smartphone. I think grabbing onto those as people said, well, can it do this? All of a sudden they were able to implement ideas and aspects of the smartphone that they'd never thought of way back when the initial concepts came about. Think about how stable the smartphone has been. 11 years now, something like that. It really has been in the same shape it is. Now, they've made minor changes. Think about this. How about a tennis shoe or a sports shoe? Think about the innovations that they have there. And I have friends who work in manufacturing companies who do sports equipment and shoes and other things. And all of them say 
that they've found Agile to be a really good tool in bringing these products to market. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I I played hockey as a youngster. When I look at my nephew's hockey equipment compared to <laughs> <laughs> now, I didn't. I was not there in the you know in the early early days when they basically strapped Christmas catalogs around their shins. No, no, it was it was well beyond that. But the advancement, just even in material, but you're absolutely right. Agile happened to be that iterative improvement to those particular aspects of the game. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so let's let's go ahead and pivot from this. Um so we talk about how agile is. We talked about complexity and risk and how we can use risk to manage complexity. What other ways can we actually protect the project from complexity and its influences? Why, to, in my mind, the best way to protect a project from the influence of complexity is to understand that complexity happens. And that way you're even prepared for the unknowns. You know, if you're, if you're sort of humming along and the project's going well and suddenly something comes at you that you weren't expecting and you're caught by surprise and it throws the whole project into chaos, that is not good. But if you're humming along and things are going well and you are at all times looking over your shoulder, looking to the left, look, what's coming at me? What could be coming at me? If you're always in that anticipatory uh, status, then you are much more um, ready to handle the complexity that hits you. And I think that's important to understand is complexity isn't just at the beginning of the project. It can occur at any time during the life cycle of the project. I I was heavily influenced by the whole concept of three-point estimation when I went through my preparation for the certification exam. Um, and I thought, that's brilliant. You know, if you look at a pessimistic and an optimistic outcome, you're actually bounding the problem. Yeah. What What could happen in the best of all worlds and what could happen in the worst of all worlds. And that gives you basically a domain within which you, you, you don't have this big whole thing called ambiguity. Now you have, okay, now I can think clearly within this range. And, and so I, I think this is one of the ways too. it's, 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 it's partly that there's another piece too, that I want to actually introduce. Lessons learned. <laughs> yeah, I, that's my favorite and I missed it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, again, how many times in the next 50 years do you think corporations and projects will be disrupted by things like COVID and lockdown? <laughs> or by the CEO leaving or by a new piece of regulation or by, yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're not going to be caught again. A good project manager will not be caught again. They will be proactive. And and yes, the list for 20 and 30 years of being in, in the business is, is scary. But at the same time, you know, there's a reason why that list is big. Well, do, do you remember the little story I gave a little earlier in terms of that ma massive legislative change where we had to kind of sit back and think, how are we going to deal with what we've already done? Can we salvage anything? Yes. So uh, I said that it introduced complexity. I never said it caught us by surprise. <laughs> now, and, and here's, and I'll explain that because I was part of a corporation that absolutely had been caught by surprise years earlier by such things, but had learned to put liaisons in the halls of Congress with their ears to the ground. So they could anticipate something coming, warn the projects that something was coming, but we didn't necessarily know, know everything about what was coming. So we knew something complex. We were ready for it. We just didn't know the, the intimate rules of what was about to hit us. So that's one way of dealing with it, knowing the sources of, of how complexity is introduced and being prepared for whatever comes. And, and you know what? I, I, this is why I enjoyed so much 
working with companies that have been around for a century right. because they had a track record and, and they've made all the mistakes and they survived. Um, that And, you know, again, this speaks very strongly to your statement. Things are going to go wrong. Things are going to go off the rails yeah. and we have to have a plan for when things are going to go off the rails. The best corporations um, are that way. And the best projects should also be that way. Well, and the reason what you said is so true, because what often happens on projects is projects that fail could be often as a result of our chaotic response to complexity happening versus those that chug along as though nothing happened is because someone was prepared for something hitting them in a surprise fashion. Mm -hmm. It's our response. Often it's our response to complexity that can either contribute to or minimize what's going to happen with that, with that situation. You know, that brings, that brings me up to a really important question. And maybe we can talk about this for a bit. We're, we're talking about protecting projects from, from complexity. Do you think there's ever an opportunity that we can take advantage of complexity? I think so. And I'm, as I'm kind of searching how we could do that, but I think, again, knowing that complexity will happen, not necessarily knowing what the source of that complexity will be, one um, one ability, and this is kind of um, a byproduct, I think, of what your question is asking. Knowing that it's going to hit, I can always be on my toes. I can teach myself in my mindset as a project manager to always be expectant of something like that that's about to hit. So the byproduct is to make me a better project manager because I am more prone to understanding that something is going to hit the project as opposed to just being caught unawares that's one byproduct i can think of yeah and and to actually follow on with what you said and we'll explore a couple other ways we could actually look at it later but to follow on with what you just said um it's not necessarily a bunch of extra work that you do it may just be an attitude yeah. and an attitude you can teach each other preparing the team and preparing the stakeholders in such a way that said you know instead of us making a formal change control let's do the work in such a way that we think of it as a normal set of just correcting our course constantly and yeah. doing it as a group through consensus and all of a sudden it's not something that's extra work or extra labor or extra effort and getting in the way of our progress but it's part of the progress itself and this is the true beauty of agile you won't find me an agile advocate i i love all methodologies but i think agile is very eloquent when it has this type of an approach where we say we're not going to make these right hand turns all the time we're going to adjust things like you adjust a ship or you adjust an orchestra playing this huge piece of music yeah I, you and i have used this analogy before but let's say you're on an let's say you're piloting a plane from san francisco to new delhi you don't, the pilot doesn't just set the heading and then go to sleep for the next 18 hours. <laughs> there, there, there are course corrections all along the way to keep them on the heading. And so I think that's exactly what you're saying is you can't just sort of, you're not just going to sort of set the, the schedule in place, the budget in place and say, okay, we're done. I'm all I have to do is just make sure that we deliver. No, we have to watch for those constant chances to do course corrections to keep that project on 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 time and on budget let me let me give you another example first of all let me set the the tone okay so complexity has a component of risk yes when i say risk risk is not just threats risk is also opportunities correct yeah. now so here i was working with an investment firm and they had a tiered structure for customer support. And I was working with the corporation 
um, on managing fleets of workstations. And I met the director of the help desk that worked with their top tier customers. These, these people that have those mysterious cards that allow you to do anything on the planet, right? Um, and he said, Tim, you don't realize what you have here. I said, what? And he said, well, you're selling me the fact that, you know, it's it's going to be cheaper in the long run if I create this this structure of renewal and replacement and using the automated um, upgrades and patch management. But you know what else you can do with it? And he showed me a way that actually you could manage the computers remotely in such a way that even in a 24 hour a day workshop with about 5,000 computers, um, you can actually control the power usage of the whole operation. And I turned a 26% return on investment over the first two years of the implementation of this process to 126% return on investment. It had been under my nose for three years. Mm. And it was only when I had that actual understanding that he said, that is the true value that I've been trying to look for. And you helped me find it. And I said, I don't know what I did, but thank you. And I thought about that. I should have been catching that. But the problem was, you know, I didn't understand all the pieces of that that director's world and how my work would influence it. It wasn't until we'd been working together that we actually discovered this together. You know, somehow every discussion you and I have, regardless of how technical we are with methodology, we somehow always end up back to the human relationship aspects. <laughs> of, of you know, and do. yeah, exactly. And it's not just, <clears throat> it's not just interaction with other people. It's the relationship we have with ourselves, mm. our attitude and our approach to work, our attitude and our approach to solving problems, and how we treat ourselves in these moments of ambiguity and complexity. Well, that was in it because your your question was, what can can we take advantage of complexity? And I remember, I remember to this day. In fact, I'm probably have <laughs> getting cold, sweaty hands right now, thinking. I was a brand new project manager um, on a on a project, and we happened to get hit by one of those complex situations that we were unprepared for. And I was I was very new, embryonic in my in my project management. And I remember for weeks I couldn't sleep at night. I was having trouble digesting food. I was I mean it was one of those things where the complexity of the situation caused incredible anxiety for me as the project manager, not knowing that I could go to others for help, you know, just to deal with it. What's interesting, we talked about attitude or mindset. Now, when I'm dealt with something like that, I look at it as a challenge. And I say, okay, how are we going to solve this? We just got this, this monkey wrench thrown into our um, deers here. How are we going to solve this problem? And we get, and I think you used an, an analogy a little while ago, but spending two or three days to kind of go through the solution. That's one of my favorite things is grab my team leads, grab some of the people out of the field and just really sit down and work through the problem. It's no longer one of those, I can't sleep, I can't eat. It's now give it to me because I'm going to solve it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And as a project manager, it took me almost a decade to learn what you're talking about, which is in the heat of the moment, in the middle of the emergency, you're not going to solve the problem. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, that, it's, and again, we're looking at an attitude or a mindset that says, you know, it, it's... <sighs> we can't do it with all of our jumbled thoughts. Let's pull back a little bit and relax. And the thing is, with this attitude and mindset, you're going to find that you're going to have less competition as a project manager. Well, that example I just gave where I was having the, you know, the anxiety over what was going on, 
I remember when I finally brought it to my VP, he just looked at me and goes, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> I mean, they, they can't shoot you. <laughs> they can't set your house on fire. They, what's the worst? Let's figure this out. Let's work it out. And, you right. know, it's all it took was that calming presence. That, yeah, it is a problem. He acknowledged it. It was a problem. We had to deal with it. We lost money. What, but what's the worst that can happen? You will lose money on some projects. It's yeah. just gonna and, happen, right? And just like that VP and just like you and me, this is something that you can learn and practice and get very, very good at. I'm, I'm trying to think back over our last 45, 50 minutes. Have we turned a complex discussion and made it more simple? Or have we added complexity to our complex discussion? <laughs> I think we did a little bit of a vote. Yeah. Um, I think we're coming up to some common themes. Um, this principle, in some ways, is very similar to the other principles. Um, human behavior mm -hmm. is a major component to actually understanding and learning how to embrace complexity. Complexity is a fact, and it's something that we're going to deal with on every project and with enough practice, we can get good at it. Yeah, I think, and if, you know, we always kind of end these podcasts with what I would tell an, an up and coming project manager, an emerging project manager who wants to learn some of the ropes. And again, this is not textbook. This is not 100%. This is based on our experience, based on the situations that we describe. But if I were to advise a young project manager, I would tell them exactly what you just said complexity will happen and I, and I this is probably the fifth time I'm going to say this it's not introduced just at the beginning of the project being that complex problem you're trying to solve it's going to rear its head regardless and we just need to be prepared for that so I think if I was to tell an emerging project manager how how to handle these things is just expect them and then just keep your head cool get your team around you and just look at what it is to that what it will take to solve the problem Yep. Yep. And, and again, um, the role of a project manager is not to solve the problem, but to create the environment and bring together the people that actually can do it better than you. <laughs> well, and you know, here's what's interesting. I can go back over probably a, more than a handful of projects where the solution came from a two-year programmer on the line because they were the closest to the issue. And they say, hey, why don't we think about doing it this way? And, and so the light bulbs went on everywhere. You know, yeah, it's just and, and, and that's, I think that's when we get really good experts at complexity, yeah. where we're able to find these wild ideas or these, uh, these observations that nobody else saw. Um, innovation um, is, I think is born of complexity. It's just the nature of the work we do and it never ends. Well, and the other thing we talked about a little bit on this project, well, fair amount was agile. Um, <laughs> and so even if, even if you're thinking predictive or if you're thinking of a hybrid or whatever approach you're using to the project, the idea is to have that methodology in place that you're true to, because again, the methodology will allow for those um, issues of complexity and, and give you the tools with which you can then handle them. So uh, always be prepared, but stick to that methodological approach to getting your project done. Indeed, indeed. So thank you for this wonderful conversation today, Merv. This has been a delight. It was. It was. And um, if we want to reach out to you this next week, where would uh, we get hold of you? Uh, back on good old LinkedIn, I was approached by several people even this week, and uh, and it, it just it's just nice to be able to talk to people even through um, what do they call them DMs, direct messages. So even through that, so it's been good. That's great. Yeah, uh, myself as well. Um, I continue to be uh, contacted by many people who've been my students in the past, but um, any of you who are just rambling through uh, these recordings and find something like that, if you have a question or you have something that's burning inside you, you need the answer to. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I'm certain that like Merv said, if we put our heads together and create you know, a little bit of 
uh, <laughs> a little bit of peace, I, I'm sure we can find something out. Yeah, and I'm not afraid to say I don't know, but here's someone who might. So yeah, absolutely. This exactly gets together and just let's let's build a community here of problem solvers, better project managers in the long run. Thank you. That's a noble idea, and it sounds very enjoyable, too. So thanks again, and thanks again, everybody checking in and looking forward to talking with you again next week.